Hey there, and welcome to the podcast Tiling Connect, hosted by Mark Moskwa. This show is designed to connect people with the best information intended to strengthen the business of tiling. To keep up to date with all the episodes, don't forget to subscribe. Tiling Connect is brought to you by Lux's Greats, the leaders in aluminium drainage, which are UV stable, rust proof and customizable on site. Available at your local tile or plumbing shop. Hey everybody, Mark here from Tiling Connect. Welcome to today's episode. I have uh, another fantastic guest on with us today, someone that I recently connected in with online, and that's going to be our theme today. It's going to be talking about digital marketing. I'd like to welcome to the show, Natalie Grace from Initiation Co. Hopefully I've said that right, Natalie. Yeah, welcome. That's it. Thank you, Mark. It's such a pleasure to be here speaking with you today. Yeah, thank you. You too. And I love the online digital communities, right? When you when when you have the time, of course, obviously, I'd love to spend tons more time in there, but there's only so many hours in a day. But when you actually do connect in with people, it's actually pretty cool and the things that you can learn. So, um, you know, our podcast is obviously all about tiling and, and the industry that I work in. And, you know, when we connected, we were talking about uh, marketing and that sort of stuff. And I think that's where the synergies were, which were awesome. So I um, would love to start off today's episode by really getting to know a little bit about your background and, and our community would love to know a little bit more about you and what pathway you jumped on to get here today. Yeah. So I'm Natalie. I'm from Initiation Co. I founded at this, it's a digital consulting agency this year. After working, having quite a long background doing digital marketing, digital project management, digital production for big businesses, small businesses, corporate government, everything in between. I took a little break, but I really have my passion kind of stoked again, um, remembering how much I enjoy working with small business and helping small businesses solve their problems and become more efficient and effective in their digital marketing. So my background, I'm qualified or got out of uni qualified as a photographer. So I started oh, wow. out in actually online, like a catalog photography when in its early stages. And I'd always enjoyed sales as well. So while I was studying, I was working for some pretty big brands, Hewlett Packard in sales. I was working also um, in e-commerce with a very large cosmetics retailer, beauty retailer in Australia. Uh, and I mm-hmm. learned a lot about what it is to market a business online in these early stages, these foundational stages. I kind of got bored with with working um, in such a solitary environment with photography. However, I always loved working online. So that led me to be, be building websites. And eventually I got my start professionally in managing apps, actually with Yellow Pages in Australia. So oh, I've wow. got this connection with trades and services. And I have that from my family as well. Uh, my parents both run small businesses with my dad working as a floor sander. So I've had exposure to to what it is to work in the trade since I was a little kid. And yeah, I'm always fascinated by the different ways we can use the digital space and online marketing to promote and share what we do, make connection with with Mm. people, whether it's customers or through networking, to just spread our message and the work we do in the world. Wow. That was perfectly said. And that was great. Thank you for sharing so much. And uh, so the business is new, early part of what you're doing, that's terrific but certainly you've jumped from um, step to step to get where you are today and that's that's cool big box um, like the um, the photography side of things mm. tell me a little bit more about that like because I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know what does that look like what have, what do you what do you learn like in that in that sort of trade? Yeah. Yeah. I guess it is a trade, isn't it? Um, Especially with what I was doing, I actually was drawn to it from an artistic perspective. But when I finish, it's really hard to make money out of art photography. And I, I really liked honing my skills in taking photos of products. So that's There's a, as far as what I learned, there's kind of practical aspects of photography and then there's more artistic and theoretical aspects, but I really loved playing with light and composition 
And that's mm. really in a very basic form what product photography is. It's all about yeah. composition and it's all about making sure that you're using space and light to make the product look as amazing as it can possibly look. So yeah, that's that's really how I got my start. And I was able to work for a few years running my own studio, doing very finicky <laughs> technical photography uh, for cosmetics products, which are highly reflective. So it was always yeah. a challenge, but a fun challenge. With the the skill that you have in that space, did you find, and we were talking about this a little bit earlier on, about me living in Melbourne and um, mm. you know having a bit of a conversation about that, did you find that you were doing a bit of that photography during COVID in Melbourne? Was that something that you were sinking your teeth into a little bit or was it? No. So here's no. the thing. I was doing photography, oh, I'm showing my age now, 15 to 20 years ago. That was when oh, I was wow. working in that in that part of my profession, but I found my way to working in online. And actually I got so burnt out on the the aspects of I, photography was my passion growing up, but I burnt myself out making it my career. And I haven't really, unfortunately, touched a camera much since, to be honest. So I did some wow. travel photography when I was traveling the world, but yeah. it's not something I've returned to. I think about it sometimes. Yeah. And in COVID, uh, it would have been a really interesting time to be taking photos of Melbourne and Victoria. But yeah, it's not something that I touched at that time, no. Wow. Well, you look great, although you know, you, you're talking about it. You know, 15 years ago, I'm I'm trying to connect all the dots. But anyway, <laughs> I just look. I um look. Let's so Initiation Co. Yeah. Tell me more about that. I mean, it's a new company. Um, yeah. You call it a startup, right? You you obviously um, kicking goals. And um, <laughs> what was the inspiration behind getting into that? Yeah, like I said, I really missed working with small business. So throughout my yeah. career after photography, I've worked with some pretty big companies in government. I've worked um, uh, in agencies as well as managing contracts uh, on client side. So I've seen all aspects and I really love working with small business. And when I thought about how I can help small business, what can I do differently to other people offering digital consulting services? Because that's what I specialize in now. It's really providing value and demystifying the digital space for small business owners because I know firsthand we often don't have much time to immerse ourselves in learning about what digital marketing is, all the different channels, all the different strategies. It's so time consuming and it can make it seem really scary and really complicated, but it's mm -hmm. actually quite possible to break it down if you focus on the main priorities. And that's really what's driving me to work with small businesses to help demystify digital marketing for them and to help them feel empowered in the marketing they're doing for their businesses online. Okay. Yeah, awesome. Well, look, let's explore that a little bit more because obviously there's a, a number of different marketing aspects to how you can do things online, social and through social media, digital mm. marketing, websites, that sort of thing. What are the sort of the different, I suppose, from my perspective, can you give us a bit more of an overview of the, the different marketing channels and yeah. which... Of um, which offer the best ROI, um, best yeah. return on investment. You know, particularly I suppose in that trades and tiling niche. You know, mm. you know as you know, being in a, that trade space, obviously that's our community. And and um, if there's any relatable facts there, you can share. And also, yeah. what areas of the marketing should they avoid? Like, what are the what are the areas that you know provide low or possibly no you know good ROI? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. So there's lots of different marketing channels and you can really feel swamped and overwhelmed when you're trying to like do everything in every channel. It's just not mm. possible. So it's really, you ask a really good question, which ones offer the best ROI specifically for the tiling trade, but tra trades in general. I definitely think websites are worth gold. <laughs> it's yeah, basically really? like, yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Um, because that's where you can do a lot of your good search engine optimization, your on-page stuff, because there's yep. different aspects of SEO. So I definitely say websites are a, a super important channel and you want to see that as the face of your business. In marketing, we talk about a customer journey and it's the same with, with trades as it is with say e-commerce, for instance. When someone decides they need something, there's a problem that arises and they go on a journey through realizing the problem to solving the problem. And so you want to reach them at the really important moments on the journey where they're at the point of, of researching and then considering and making a decision. Mm -hmm. And then if you can, if you're in a business where there's a possibility for repeat custom, you also want to be in that retention space as well. And it's 
if you think about it that way, not every channel is great for every step on that journey. So Mm. different channels serve different purposes. But at the very beginning, when someone has a problem, say that they have, you know, they're renovating and they know they want to redo their bathroom and they want a good tiler, they will be in a planning stage when they're researching. Okay, who are the tilers around in my area? Which ones have the best reputations? Which ones do the work that I'm seeking? Whether Mm. it might be like super creative or it might be really budget focused. So they're they're thinking about what they need and they're doing this research like stage of of their yeah. journey. They're going to be seeking online, so they're going to be doing Google searches. They're going to be talking to people in their network, whether that's mm. in person or online, to see if they can find any recommendations. They might be looking in business directories. So at that stage of the journey, that researching phase when they're trying to narrow down who they actually want to contact for, say, a quote or for some more information, that's where, you know, the search engine marketing, the search engine optimization and um, being, you know, listed in business directories is really important. Also making sure that you're appearing on local search, on local Google search. And that you've got decent reviews up there because I I think it's very hard to avoid reviews in this day and age and people really do consider those when they're making a decision. Mm. Um, And then once they've gotten through that research phase and they've got a short list, then that's where your website is key because they're going to be comparing the different options, the different service providers to see who give who's like most aligned with what they're actually seeking. Mm. This is where you get to show your values, your USP, your unique service proposition, what makes you stand out from your competitors, what your values are and your personality as well. So all those things you get to showcase on your website that don't get much airtime anywhere Mm. else up to that point. So I think websites are super important for, for really promoting your brand and what you do. And then after that, you know, you've got things like email marketing. So if someone's filled out a form on your website, you want to make sure that there's, you know, ideally an automated process, but at least an organized process to stay in contact with them and make the most of that lead. So, so yeah, social is also important there, but I think social, we have to be careful about with, with social media platforms because say Instagram, and if we're talking about paid advertising, especially it can be a bit of a money pit. We have Mm. to understand our objective here. So brand recognition is really great for a platform like Instagram, but might not drive that many leads. Whereas Facebook, where people hang out in community, like where we met and how we connected, having something in common is a really useful place to be spending some time, not too much time, because it's it's always a temptation with social media and we can feel overwhelmed. But if you're connected in with your community, your location, your local area that you market to through things like community pages, buy, swap, sell pages, those kinds of pages on Facebook are such valuable places to get leads because People are going there and actively asking for recommendations for tilers, for instance, in their area because they need mm. something done. So it's kind of like a place where there's warm leads. And if you're if you're there making sure that you're involved in that community and checking in those posts every, you know, a few times a week, you can be responding and getting leads that way. And once you build a reputation, you can also have people there doing marketing for you for free saying, I've worked with this guy. He's great. Here's yeah. his details. Yeah, and that, and that that sort of goes back into that that review piece, right? And mm. ensuring that you're looking for reviews or seeking reviews, and having some sort of platform where you can actually capture reviews and use that to your advantage. And whether that yeah. be through website or digital media marketing or email marketing, whatever it might be, you can use it. At, I, I met, well, I don't want to make too many assumptions because I'm I'm interviewing the professional today. I'm not the professional. <laughs> yeah, that's that that's how I see things. And but I'm I'm very interested in and. Picking up on one thing you said earlier, and it was some, uh, it was part of a question that I had a little bit for later on. I was very unsure about whether or not websites were like a that they fitted in within that criteria of you should do it. Yep. I was always of the belief that websites were becoming a little bit antiquated, and that digital media was taking over in every aspect. Mm. And then when I did my website for Tiling Connect, I only did it about probably about three or four months ago. Now it was part of my 2023 planning, Mm. yet I used a very basic template and platform to set it up. I haven't had, you know, I'm not driving it as much as probably someone in the trade is because they're actually Mm. out there. The trade is their business. That's what they do every day. And and, and I have a day job. So it's, it's a very different thing for me. Yet 
when I started creating it and putting it together and getting my um, creative juices flowing to do all the colouring in department stuff, it was a lot of fun putting it together. Yeah. It's actually quite simple. And these, these days, a website creation is is really easy compared to, you know, 10 years ago. Like it is, it was, it took me a, a couple of hours just to put something together because it's all template derivative and you yep. can just, you know, copy and paste and you put it together mm. and you go, oh, wow, it's actually pretty cool. I'm an artist. Yep. <laughs> but anyway, getting back to my original point, I wasn't, I was, I was sitting on the fence about websites, about, you know, their use and whether or not they actually added any value. Mm, yeah. And it's, you know, that's a very fair point and question. From my perspective, I think, you know, we all spend heaps of time online, but we're not mm. always on social media. We're often shopping on websites, you know, we're doing research yeah. on websites. Social media, when used effectively in business, leads you off social media onto your real estate online. And that's what's valuable about a website because you get to control that. The other mm. thing that's a bit dangerous about having full reliance on social media platforms is that their algorithm changes and even um, SEO for that matter, Google algorithm changes. And one day you can be doing really great. And the next day, all of a sudden something's happened in their system and you are not seeing the same traffic. You're not seeing the same interactions with your content. You yeah. need to have a diversification of, of marketing activity and marketing um, marketing campaigns to make sure that you're not overly reliant on any one channel. And all of those channels can basically lead to your website. So another way to think about it is um, think about when you're trying to shop around for a, a tradie, recommendations are really important, but I, you probably wouldn't book someone without checking out their website, right? Definitely not. No, every time. If I'm, It doesn't matter what I'm doing. I use websites a lot like my partner and I recently just bought or purchased, I should say, some external blinds for our balcony. And it was all website based um, hmm. research and reviews and um, looking at different companies and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes you can get a good, a, a decent website, say out of a like a premium listing with a business directory and that might serve you, but mm. you want to make sure that whatever website you have, and like you said, it's actually so much cheaper and easier to put together a website now than it was a while ago. You needed a developer and you wouldn't always know how to use it in the admin panel or the back end. It was very complicated to manage and update yourself. It's so yeah. much easier now. If you need to do an update quickly, because say you change your phone number or you're changing your pricing or you've got a new product, you can do that so easily on your own without even needing like an old webmaster. So yeah. it's definitely cheaper and easier to manage a website than it used to be. But yeah, I think I think it's super important because that's ultimately where people go to check that you're professional. You know, mm -hmm. if they want to know if you have an ABN, they're going to look on your website to see if it's listed somewhere. They're going to check if you look dodgy or not on your website. So that's why yeah. it's important to have the website because that's where you can show that you're a professional and mm. here's my values as a professional and here's the services I offer. And if they gel with what you're offering, they're very likely to get in contact if they've made it so far as your website. Yeah, I, I posted a social media post in the last couple of days on my social channels because the two channels that I typically focus on for my digital media marketing are Instagram and LinkedIn. Yep. They tend to be the best ROI for me mm -hmm. in terms of sharing the message and building the community and getting more people on board with what my ultimate vision and mission is for Tiling Connect. And um, one of the things, and we, and we talked about in this particular post, we talked about making sure that you're comfortable with the contractor that you're going to choose to do the work for you. So, and that forms part of that selection process process of selecting the right tiler. Um, mm. So, yeah, to that point. And also one of the other things that I found out recently, and it was just through listening to could have been Alex Hermosi or one of the other digital media marketing experts at a global. And one of the things with social media is that the information that you've got on there, it's all borrowed. Mm. You don't own it. It's owned yeah. by those companies. So if you're not capturing the data of your customers through your website, then if anything happens and those accounts get frozen or you get locked out or those platforms decide to suddenly close their doors, it's all gone. Mm -hmm. 
So you have to start again if you can capture that data. And the only, the only the best way to capture that data is through a website. Yeah, definitely. I see this a lot actually in the networks that I'm a part of with people who are maybe more fashion based, who mm. rely a lot on a platform like Instagram. And all of a sudden one day, it's not just that the algorithm changes and they have less reach whole accounts disappear and you get mm. locked out and you don't get it back. I've, I've seen this more than once and it's devastating. And yeah. in many industries, your website's avail- your valuable real estate and then your email list is super valuable too because that's your customer list that you own. You know, mm. if your followers went missing on Instagram, you're never going to get them back, but you own your customer database. And and the way they, they really um, get into that database is yeah, either through giving you a call and you, you know, you get their details that way, but usually through your website, through forms yeah. on your website. Yeah, very cool. Well, moving on, because I've got many questions today, of course, <laughs> and then I don't want to keep you all night. The Tiling Podcast mindset is very much centered around build, uh, strengthening the business of tiling. Yep. So what do you believe would be the most important digital marketing activities, tradies should consider using to help promote um, their promote their brand, I suppose promote and build their brand and also target their desired audience, like you know who they're trying to talk to. Mm-hmm. To take it one step back, I think this is a really good question because before we invest any time or money into digital marketing campaigns, you do want to have some of those really important questions answered, like who are your target customers? Who is your ideal? customer. You want to know as much about them as possible and then where they hang out and what they care about, what values are important to them and what drives their decision-making process so that you can tailor what you're offering, whether it's it's organic content or whether it's paid ad messaging to, you know, resonate with with them and those parts of, of your um, ideal customer. So the other thing you want to also understand is your goal or your objective. So, you know, we think that we can assume that every time we engage in some form of digital marketing, it's all about generating sales or leads. But often um, there's there's other aspects too. Brand awareness is a really important part. If you're a new business, you're going to be doing a lot of brand building to begin with um, to get your very first customers. And then you're going to be leveraging reviews and, and their recommendations to build on your business and start getting more into that that growth phase where you're focused very heavily on, on lead gen. So you want to know your goals and objectives, and then you also want to know your target audience. And then you can decide because the target audience question is very important because mm-hmm. once you know who they are, then you can know, well, where do they hang out? Where online do they spend their time? And when they're looking for what sort of information, and that's how you decide which channels best suited to your, you know, what your objective is. So if you are trying to say, do brand awareness. If you're a new a new brand, it might be that you are creating a special and you could promote that on Instagram and try to get followers, but it's highly unlikely that Instagram uh, followers are going to actually do business with you. They might mm. follow you and make you look legitimate. You, they might make you look professional because you're not a, an empty page with five people, but they're probably not going to be the people who actually, you know, engage your services. So you're much better off creating an intro offer and going onto one of those Facebook community pages and putting yourself out there, you know, mm. with an offer to get and and leading them to your website, a form on your website, so you can capture their details and market to them again in future, even if nothing happens from this particular lead. So there's your say at Facebook, a social channel working with your website to then enrich your your email database, for instance. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to add as well, local search, it's not something I'm an expert in. I work with experts who, who are like masters at local search, but yeah. local search is obviously a really, really important one for for tradies and tilers because location-based search you know you want to make sure that the money you spend and the time you spend because not all marketing we do is paid for but especially the paid stuff you're actually targeting and reaching people in the location you service rather than wasting money or you know in your advertising communicating with people who are in another state because that happens so often yeah yeah wow so I've got two question, two follow-up questions to ask. Well, probably a statement than a question. Interesting, I never thought about how beneficial that using the local marketplace 
areas could be for a mm. contractor. For a, or, um, you know, obviously, I'm going to be a bit biased here. We're talking about tilers and people in the stone industry, but yeah. certainly that could be for a number of trades. Could be a plumber, it could be a sparky, it could be a chippy, it could be anybody that's in a local area. I I live in Mango Hill, you know, I could be a tradesperson and I get involved in a few of the local uh, marketplace groups, and and that could particularly lead to a lot of extra work. So that's I call that a bit of a golden nugget. That, that that's I learned something, and I'm sure the audience and community will learn something. The other part is, so let's say that I'm a trade contractor today, and I've been you know, tiling for, I don't know, five years, five, six years, and I don't have any media and all of the work that I get, or I don't have any marketing or brand awareness or anything like that at all. Mm-hmm. And all of the work that I get through word of mouth. Should I start doing branding and marketing today or should I just keep doing what I'm doing? Look, if you've got a good stream of leads coming in that you're able to convert uh, without it, don't spend extra time and money that you don't need to. However, mm. you can still leverage that existing um, custom base you have, making sure that you you have a customer database that you can market to in the future if you choose. When times get slow, for instance, or when you have a new service that you're adding to your, your repertoire, for instance, you also want to leverage them for ratings and reviews. So making mm. sure that it's you know it's great if they are ta- there's no better marketing than word of mouth that comes. Yeah that's just worth gold. But if you can get the people at the end to make sure they give you a review on Google, then that's even better because that's, you know, this archived gold that's that's mm. going to be actual currency for you that's going to help for the people who are online searching for, for you or your services. They're going to see that and it's going to help, you know, make you appear really good at what you do, trustworthy, uh, dependable, quality, all of those things that comes with a, a five-star review it's gold. So even if you're not someone who needs to market, make sure that you're making the most of your existing customer base so that um, you can add value without having to spend too much time or too much money if you don't need to. Look, and I agree wholeheartedly with what you said. I think one of the key takeaways for me there is that you can never be 100% certain about the unpredictability of what's going to happen in the marketplace. And we're seeing a little bit of that at the moment. I know that there's a, and you've probably seen it as well in your circles, we've got a massive shortage of trades across all different disciplines, across every state in Australia. But at the same time, we also have a complete a little bit of dysfunctionality happening in the building and construction industry because we've had, mm. I don't know how many builders have gone um, into receivership the last 12 months. It's, it's a big number. And I don't think that we're at the end of that yet. And then we have a shortage of houses, shortage of dwell- affordable dwellings to throw mm. into the mix. And then the prices of um, construction materials haven't particularly, de- they haven't gone backwards from when they've gone up. So it's a perfect storm. And I think, you know, a marketing and branding piece of your business for anybody is critically important, whether whether you have a word of mouth pipeline or not, there will be a day at some point in the future that, you know, something might happen and, and you may not have any customers and then you've got nothing to lean on to be able to develop that pipeline again. Mm. Yeah, that's why it's really good to have an awareness of what marketing is, even if you don't need it mm. right now, what yeah. the valuable channels are, how you can start for free, like the the amazing, this is why I love talking about those Facebook pages. It's because it's free Free. and (laughs) that can be something that your family's helping you with. You might have a tradie wife or husband who spends more time on it than you do, who can be checking in with those pages regularly and responding. It could be something that you're scheduling for yourself to do a few times a week, but it's free and it's so valuable. Mm. Um, So definitely knowing what to do and not what not to do. And this is something that I'd love to offer your listeners. I've got a little PDF that I'm I'm making um, that goes through the channels and what to do and what not to do for a tradie. So just having having an awareness of that so you don't waste time or waste money on stuff that's not going to be very effective because you don't quite know where to hone your attention, Mm. where the most value lies. Even if you don't need it now, it could be really useful in the future to have that information in your back pocket. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I will definitely get that off you at the end of the show and we'll put that in the show notes because I think that'll be super cool. And thank you for being (laughs) so generous and putting that together. Absolutely. Natalie, We've already covered that question, so I'm going to move forward to the next one. Yep. What metrics? So, what metrics should you use to measure the performance of marketing, and what do you do with that information when you have it? Like, what? Tell us, talk us through the steps 
the, mm. some of the critical steps that are, that are involved. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think the first thing is, like I said at the beginning, you want to know uh, what your goal is because you can't really measure success metrics if you don't have a goal or objective. So firstly, you want to know what it is. Is it brand awareness or is it is it leads, for instance? And then you want to think about your channel. So depending on the channel, there's different metrics. So say if we're talking about websites, it's actually really good if you have a website to know how effective your website is by maybe measuring its or doing analytics, kind of reviewing the analytics on a weekly or monthly basis, maybe monthly is enough. And you have to know what you're looking for. So say with a website, you're going to be looking at, well, how many people are visiting my website and what are they doing when they're on there? So metrics like sessions, users, events such as leads, which comes through someone doing an action of say, filling out a form or even a sale. If you do have a buy button of some form on your website, that's all captured in Google Analytics, which is completely free. And then you also want to look at referral traffic as well. Oh, and bounces. So bounces is Mm -hmm. another metric about behavior on the website. People are coming, you can see how long they're spending on the website, which pages they go to, but a bounce is basically when they leave. So how long before they leave, that kind of thing. And then referrals is really important. I think from a marketing perspective, that's always my favorite thing to check on. So with all of the marketing channels that I am investing my time or money in, which ones are driving traffic to my website and how much? So traffic referrals is really important there too. Yeah, nice. You can do the same thing with SE. So say for the search console, Google have this Google search console. So if you're registered Mm. to use the analytics of that, it's going to tell you about how many appearances your brand is having on Google search, how many clicks you're getting out of that or phone calls because the phone numbers link to that too. So depending on the channel, there'll be different metrics, but basically you want to know you know, how many people are seeing what you're doing and what are they doing with that information? Are they clicking? Are they calling? And how much you're spending obviously is super important too. So one of the most important factors, if you have a marketing budget and a marketing spend is to be measuring the ROI because you want to make sure that what you're spending is returning value for you. You don't want it to be an endless pit of money that's not driving any leads or sales for you. No, exactly. And and picking up on that last point that you make, and I know it's difficult to determine because everyone's situation and environment is completely different. A brief word from our sponsor. Are you looking for a water drainage solution that serves its purpose and adds a touch of elegance to your space? Lux's grates are here to revolutionise your indoor and outdoor applications. Whether it's a shower, bathroom, balcony, pool, or any other area, Lux's grates is the ideal choice. It's quick and easy installation that you can bang out in just over an hour. Their standard grates offer a classic and timeless look, while the next generation style adds a modern twist to your space. Lux's grates are made of high quality anodized aluminium, ensuring durability and longevity. But is there some way of understanding, like for, from a sole trader's perspective, mm. what, what would be like an ideal number to kick off with if they were thinking about marketing and they hadn't yeah. done it before and this is their first crack at it? How do they work out what number to put for their budget? Yeah, that is such a good question. Look, I'll be honest, I'm <laughs> not a financial kind of person. I manage, <laughs> I struggle with my own budget, but I think you have to be realistic. I really do think there's a lot of marketing you can do for free. And if you're if you're starting out or you've got a limited budget, definitely focus on what the free activities you can be doing are and even just the analytics are free as well. Then if you do have a, a budget that you've allocated, I want to make sure, because I'm all about value here, I really value the money and the time of a trading, that anyone you're working with, even if it's yourself, so if you're spending money, uh, say on paid advertising, set yourself a budget. A lot of the time people might be spending, depending on how competitive their area is, their location is for the trade that they do, they could be spending hundreds of dollars a week Uh, sometimes Mm. even a day on pay-per-click advertising. Be realistic with what you have to spend. And if it's not working, don't be afraid to turn it off and try something else. That's what I'd say. Everyone's different depending on Mm. how much money they have freed up for their marketing. But be aware that if you are in a trade that has a lot of competition in a particular area, that that paid marketing is not going to be cheap. It's actually going to be quite expensive. So the more you can do for free, the better, because that's more about reputation than it is about competition of budget because that's you know that's all it comes down to with with paid advertising online 
Yeah, absolutely. And everything you said there was amazing. One thing in particular that you mentioned was don't be afraid to change. Mm. And that's really important as well. Don't set and forget because it will just, (laughs) you'll get to, you know, the six month mark, the nine month mark, you might burn through, you know, a few thousand dollars and then all of a sudden realize that "Mm, I've had two leads in nine months. So that's really important. And you can change. Like that's this is the beauty of digital marketing these days. Yeah, you know, I still remember, you know, I'm showing my age a little bit now. I still remember when I was not even in marketing, but working for a pizza company. And this is like going back over 20 years ago. And I remember working with the marketing team and you know, the numbers that they were spending on marketing and everything was locked in for contractual periods and there was no digital marketing um, media around at that stage. So it was mm-hmm. it was very, very different. But today you have the ability to turn it off and on very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And you don't have to give up either. You don't have to just no. turn it off and give up. Try different keywords. If one's not working for you, try another. Try different language in your messaging. Try a different image if, you're, if you've got images in your ads. Just keep playing with it and make sure you're watching those, the, have those success metrics there with what your, your goal that you're trying to hit and a reasonable like ROI. So the cost per lead, for instance, should be reasonable. You know, if you can't afford yeah. 150 cost per you know, for a uh, price for each lead, then, you know, you, that's, that campaign's not working for you and you've got to start tweaking it to get that, that down. But yeah, just don't be afraid because it can be very daunting to, to go into this space with advertising. So I think the main things to consider in addition to the actual like content that you're, you're creating and there's best practices, do some research online, look up, you know, best practices for effective pay-per-click ads, you know, mm. and see if you can create a little template for yourself to just to make it a bit easier for you. But yeah, you want to be informed with, with you know, the format you want to be informed with some keywords to try out and yeah you just want to have I guess a curious mindset and a realistic attitude around what you have to spend and and what your goals are yeah nice I know we've sort of already touched on this earlier on because um we 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 just spoke a lot about different things and you've shared so much which is awesome <laughs> I love that when happens that when that ever that happens in a podcast episode you're like oh there's four questions gone already but it's it's fun though right because you you can always you can spin back around onto it because I I love that about you know these things that we create and share <laughs> as a communities you touched on email marketing campaigns earlier obviously they play a big an important role in brand promotion and customer engagement. Yep. Are there are there have you in in your experience are there particular email marketing campaigns that are are better than say a standard like a, is there something that a tradie should look out for if they if let's say they've got a developed social media campaign and they've got a website but they've never got into email marketing before mm. how should they create that you know that that part of the business for them. Yeah. Okay. Well, the first thing is a platform. So you want to find a platform that you can use a lot of it, just like the emails, uh, sorry, our websites that are much easier to work with these days. Email marketing is the same. There'll be platforms uh, with templates and drag and drop and inbuilt analytics. So they've, it's actually quite simple to use now. So you, and there's lots of good options for free as well. Um, yeah. I'm sure that the tradies that we're speaking to now don't have giant email lists of, of 20,000 people, you know, it's a, it's a nice small community. And, and that's what we want. We want an engaged community with email. It's actually back in the day, you wanted the biggest list you could possibly have. Gmail penalizes you for that now, because if too many oh, people are getting your email, yeah, if too many people wow. get your emails, but not enough are clicking, they just think that you're, you're not that relevant and not many yep. people want to hear from you. So it's actually really important to have an engaged list. A smaller engaged list mm-hmm. is better than a bigger non-engaged list. Um, when you say, when you say small versus say a, a list of 20,000 are we talking under 1,000 would be a small considered a small list? Do you think? Yeah, but it's all it's all relative, you know. Yeah. You could have 60 people who are all your very best advocates and they are actually the ones that are going to see your name pop up in the inbox and click on you. So this yeah. could be people who are, you know, renovators or in other trades. This is the other thing, email's really useful because it's not everyone needs tiling done every week, you know, no. like they do need to shop at Woolies every week. So that, that weekly email from Woolies is super useful. So you have to be really strategic about, about what email's for for your business. And so yeah. um, I think thinking about it 
Tyler. It's kind of keeping yourself on the radar, getting in touch with your with your customer base if you've got any anything important to share, say changes about your company or it could be new areas that you're servicing or it, it could be some work that you're really proud of. So it, it, don't just contact them for no reason and there's no yeah. need to contact them every week. So there's two aspects of email. You definitely want email that's that's efficient and functional when it comes to firstly capturing people that you that you're in connection with so if you've got any kind of lead making sure that their email address is is inside your system if they've consented to be contacted by you so that you can be in touch in the future if you want so having that set up that connected is is important and making sure that if you've got forms on your website that it's integrated connected in with your email platform so it just yep. sends them there automatically. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing, you can actually set up what's called automation. So say someone fills out a form on your website, a contact form, you might know that sometimes you can't back to, get back to them for a couple of days. So there's an email that automatically goes out saying, thanks for getting in touch. We'll be, you can expect to hear from us within this time frame. You know, if it's urgent, call us on this number, something like that. So you can set expectations. So that's mm. that's a cool way to use automations. Another way to use automations is also after a job's finished, you can trigger an email to be sent asking them to rate or review you on Google or, or on your website and actually have the link directly to where they can review to make it as easy as possible for them because people Mm. forget so to jog their memory is very useful so they're the more practical aspects of email but then you've got email marketing campaigns and this is really strategic this is really around I have something I want to share for a specific objective so if it's to keep yourself you know if it's about brand awareness and keeping yourself relevant maybe once every quarter you're sending out an email showcasing the best work that you've done talking about any um, developments in the industry stuff like that reminding people of your contact details and what you do what you offer you might even have say like a referral program where if if someone refers you on to a friend and you land the job they might get a kickback of some sort you can be really yeah. creative with this stuff that's a good reason to remind people that that's happening through your email so yeah. they get something out of that and then the, the campaign so for tiling it's probably more about brand awareness and recognition than actually sales generation through email because it's not unless someone's been sitting on something you sending out an email being like hey do you need you know here's what we're offering do you need tiling call us you might land a few people who are in the position where they're like, oh, that's reminded me, I better give this guy a call. It's Mm. probably not going to happen though. So I think it's more about just maintaining a good relationship with your existing customer base and potentially promoting stuff that you have to promote. I I doubt that in your industry, you're doing sales and specials very often, but that's the sort of, yeah, (laughs) if that was the case, then you would send out a campaign that's marketing that particular offer. Um, So you have to be a bit more creative about how you remain in the minds of your customers, Um, but don't Mm. overload them with too much and make sure whatever you send is useful to them. Very cool. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. I love that. Natalie, I suppose getting to some really finite questions about selection processes, what I would like to know, and I think the community would like to know as well, how do you go about choosing a digital marketing partner for your website? So your email, your social media, your SEO, all of that sort of stuff. What are the things that someone should look for if they're making a call on who's the right person for them Mm. or company? Yeah, absolutely. It can be a company. There's lots of there's lots of freelancers that do this. There's lots of little agencies like what I do. And then there's there's a huge agencies. So what people are charging varies. You can you yeah. can get a lot of cheap services on a site like Fiverr using overseas freelancers doing stuff really cheap. But it's kind of the same you can have the same issues no matter which option you go for mm. on that scale of affordability and expertise. You really need to know what your objective is. So before you even engage someone, you need to know why you're doing it. And it might be that I'm not getting enough leads. I don't actually know where to look for them. I'm going to find a digital marketing agency or consultant who does lots of different channels to guide me in the right direction. But I know that I'm engaging them because I want to make this much money in the next quarter or the next year, or I want this many leads a month going forward that I'm not getting. So you have to be really, really like specific with what you're, what you're seeking, because then that's going to tell you whether they're offering you good value when you get their, their quote back around what they want to charge you. The other thing you want to do is make sure you understand, or they understand like what you do, what challenges you face, 
it's really important that the, sometimes we go to these agencies or these freelancers and they just tell us everything they do without asking us a single question about our business. Mm. A good a good digital marketer, the first thing they'll want to do is ask you all about your business so they can understand what you offer, what your USPs are, what makes you different and how they can help you. Because they're, they're creative people. Their minds will start firing off ideas. Like actually, you know, I know, I know there's a few channels that you're not working with right now that might be highly, you know, valuable for you. Like, let's talk about that. So yeah. I think alarm bells should ring if they're just talking all about themselves and they're not asking you any questions. You right. want them to ask you as many questions as possible. Yeah. Then you want to be really clear about what your engagement is and what you're paying for. I see so often, and I saw this working in agencies as well, that people knew they needed to do marketing, but they had no idea how to do it. And they thought, if I just pay this other person to do it for me, it'll all be fine and it'll be great and I won't have to worry about it. But that's when you can get taken for a bit of a ride because when you're ignorant to what you're paying for, you know, people don't have to explain what they're doing. They don't necessarily share their results with you and you don't know, you know, you haven't thought to ask how they're actually going to solve your problems or meet your objectives. So it's really important once you know what your goals and objectives are to actually say, these are my goals and objectives. Now you tell me how you're going to meet these. What methods are you going to use? What are your deliverables going to be? How many hours is it going to take you to do that per week or per month? And how much will that cost? Not just mm. how much will that cost? Because yeah. you really need to, if after three months, they're not getting you any results, you're going to have no recourse to say, well, I know you're doing, you're not doing what you said, because you don't even know what they're doing. You, yeah. you haven't gotten that information. So it's really important that in any agreement that you have with a freelancer or a consultant or an agency, that you have in writing exactly what their deliverables are. And they've, you've, you're, they're very clear and you understand how, what methods they're going to use, what channels they're going to be using, what kind of campaigns they're going to be doing, what is the work that they're going to be doing to meet your goals mm. and what results what results do they expect that they're going to deliver for you? Yeah. When they tell you those, ask that questions, what results yeah. are you going to get me? And then how, how are you going to get me those results? Explain to me what methods you'll use. Yeah. I, look, I really like that last piece. I, the, and there's so much really excellent um, advice there. I've got a few mates who are in the trade, um, different trades. And I know that reflect back on the conversations that I've had with them, I can pretty much guarantee you that none of them have actually done that. Um, yeah. not, not because they didn't want to do it. Maybe they just didn't have the knowledge around that's what they needed to do to ensure that they were getting good, great ROI and you know what they were engaging in was going to work for their business. Because sometimes you, when you have these meetings and you go in and you sit down with a marketing person or a company or a, or a freelancer, as, as, as they say, you have to do your due diligence. And sometimes you can have these meetings. You need to be courageous enough to go... You know, look, thanks so much for what you've presented, but it's not me. And maybe just say thanks, but no thanks. And then move on and find someone else. Don't just accept that, you know, the person you've spoken with is the right fit because that doesn't always happen. <laughs> so, um, yeah. and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You need to find the right partner. They may not have the experience in, in the tiling trade and they may not be able to resonate with what the, the messaging that you're trying to get out there to your community in attracting more business in for your work. Mm, yeah. And on that note too, especially if you're new to this, don't get trapped into signing up for some year long uh, retainer package trial, do a trial one, two, three months with the person and ask them, what are you going to deliver for me in this, in this trial period? You know, uh, what can I expect reasonably expect to see and hold them to account. If that doesn't come through, you're not locked into something um, yeah. that goes for a year that costs you a fortune. Yeah, exactly. Natalie, great. I am um, sorry. I've just I lost my place here for a second. Um, what out of the box? I've a couple a couple more questions before we um, head into fast track. By the way, so I'm yeah. sorry if I'm I'm going going to go a little bit over time, but I will try and be fast paced with the final questions. Cool. What out of the box ideas have you seen that have worked well in finding the best target audience online? Mm. Yeah, I think they might not be out of the box to other industries, but I think not just relying on the paid and being creative with what you can do for free. Like we talked about earlier with, with networking communities on Facebook and stuff like that. Something out of box for your industry might also be collaborations. 
you know. Mm. So it might be, I think the women in the kind of renovation design trades do this really well. Oh, um, yeah. They do lots of collaborations with each other across different like trades. So if, you know, you might do you something that could be really valuable if you're a tiler is finding some interior designers in or interior architects in your area that have a have an established following and give them some tips. So what you are is you're not just a tradie, you're not just a person who, you know, like works with their hands. You're also a subject matter expert and that's highly valuable. So what you can offer to someone like that in a collaboration is that I'm a subject matter uh, expert in what it takes to get like a fantastic finished bathroom. Let me give you some content and you can promote my business. So thinking out of the box about collaboration opportunities could be really useful and they're usually free as well. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. I like that. What can Initiation Co help our tiling community do so that they can conduct sort of a digital health check? On, mm. their, um, on their marketing provide. And again, what sort of bespoke opportunities could Initiation Co, Initiation Co. offer post that, that, that digital health check? Yeah, so I thought it was really important to, you know, I can't help everyone, but something I can do that's quite quick and easy for me is to run a health check on people's businesses. So this can be uh, for digital marketing. It can be for your website specifically. It can be for your online business. So if everything feels like it's all paper and pen and you actually want to digitize more of what you do in your business, it can be that as well, or a complete holistic health check. So basically what that is, is assessing your the current state of your business from a digital business perspective. And what I'm doing is trying to find leaky holes in the bucket that are wasting you time and money mm-hmm. and identify opportunities that you might not be aware of that can help with growth. So they're the two kind of motivators for me in offering um, these health checks. And what you get out of it is uh, firstly a report on on what I've analysed, I uh, calling out specifically the, the major issues and the highest priorities you know, uh, fixes that I recommend you take a look at. And then a full checklist of all the things that you could be doing from a digital marketing perspective. Now, whether you get me to to do those and fix them for you, or you've got other people say in your business, in your team, in your family, or even yourself to do some of that stuff. Sometimes we don't know where to start. We don't know what to Mm. prioritize. So that's what I do with those health checks. I give you a, a menu basically of stuff that you can work on to help improve your digital presence. In addition to that, I offer digital consulting services. So I do website builds and updates. I do email marketing. I love setting stuff up and basically training people to do it for themselves so they don't need me anymore. That's what I love to do. So if you want to get started, but you don't have a budget for someone to do this with you forever, I can set you up and then build out some templates and show you how to use them. And then it's all yours. Yeah. So I do that with websites. I do that with email. I do a bit of SEO as well. So I do a bit of everything, but I really have a holistic view over of issues and opportunities, I think is my my main strength. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's excellent. And we will get to the part of the episode where I ask about how people connect in with Natalie. But for now, we have our final fast track questions because we always like to learn more about our guests. And <laughs> um, hopefully you're prepared because I've got many questions, but I'm just going to choose four today, which is our okay. standard pro forma. But I always like to start with one that's a bit quirky. And I like this one. This is a real, I found this one recently. So room, desk, or car, what do you clean first and why? Desk. Why? It's really hard to focus when my desk is messy and I spend most of my day at my desk. So the desk, I'd love to say all three, but it's not true. (laughs) It'd definitely start with desk. Desk, Then room. The the cars cars always last. (laughs) I love my car, but yeah, it's it's usually, it's outside, you know. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Yeah. I'm I'm a bit of a fan of keeping the internal part of my car relatively clean. I'm horrible at keeping the outside clean. <laughs> so <I'm> like, <laughs> Tell me a little bit about, well, actually, you know, look, straight question. What's your biggest failure and what did you learn from that experience? Oh my goodness. That's such a like big and good question. Honestly, this has nothing to do. I've had many business failures and I'm, I'm in them right now. Actually, I took some time off before starting Initiation Co to go into some different industries and try stuff out. And 
I think the main, they haven't worked. And the main thing is one, I was very happy to return to my skill set and rejuvenate my passion for helping people in business. But two is to not feel ashamed when things fail. I I moved to a farm. We were talking about this just before you got on the call. I moved to the farm in 2019 that I live on now. We had grand plans for this farm. I was going to be a lavender farmer. I was going to be making essential oils. It was going to be great. And I'm just not that good at farming you know, even easy farming. And I'm okay with that. And I was really, I was really cut up about it for quite a while because it was sort of my vision. My vision didn't play out the way I expected. And I didn't love the work as much as I thought I would. And when I finally let go the shame I felt around it, all of a sudden the lavenders were just kind of flourishing on their own. And they've made a beautiful border of the farm that's, that is so lovely to be a part of, but it doesn't necessarily have to be my business, you know? Mm. It flourished anyway. So I think the main thing is nothing's ever really a failure. It's just an opportunity to learn and do something differently next time. But the main thing is don't hold shame around your failures. Try to see them as learning opportunities. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think some of the, not everyone's on the same page, right, in life. We're all different people. We're all different humans. We all do things differently. We've all learned differently. One thing that I've learned a lot in the last 20 years is that every time you fail, it's an amazing experience because you learn so much from that compared mm-hmm. to when if you if you're just consistently successful all the time there's not really any learning from that and you're not growing so from failure comes growth and then you do things differently next time and you know you don't make the same mistake well traditionally you don't make the same mistake twice <laughs> so yeah <laughs> love it if you had to write a book tomorrow what would you write about This might surprise some of your um, listeners and you perhaps too, because it's a different aspect of my passions, but it would be a tarot, a tarot reading guide. It's actually something I'm already working on. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. (laughs) Have you been working on that for a while? Yes. I I guess it's quite linked to my background, passionate about for quite a while. uh, And I work on the side, a little side hustle as a teacher a tarot teacher. (laughs) So it's something that I've been putting together as I've been working. So yeah, I've been working on it for about a year. Who knows if it's ever going to be published or not, but it's a nice (laughs) little passion project. I'll connect you in with my partner. She's a uh, Reiki um, practitioner and she's also a um, sound healer as well. So fantastic. um, she's been studying that for about three or four years. And I think she's decided she's going to I hope I'm not letting the cat out of the bag. She's not here right now, so it doesn't matter. Um, but no one's you, listening. That's fine. No, 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 no one's listening. It's my <laughs> podcast anyway. So <laughs> um, she's decided to um, sit for her master's. So um, master, master, is it master, 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 um, Reiki person? Yeah. Not, yeah, I think, yeah. So she has a master, she has a master that has taught her and yes. she's going to um, take her through that journey next year. So 2020. She's going to become a master. That's incredible. Yeah. So um, she's pretty, and she's an empath and yeah, she's yeah. very, yeah. I know that we're probably going a bit off topic and the people that in our community are probably going, where's this going? But, but yeah, anyway, I'll connect to, I'll connect you guys together after the show. So I'll, um, Love that. I'll, I'll send you some details and um, you can have a chat because she has a little bit of tarot stuff, but not, you know, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm so busy with everything everything that I'm doing. I don't particularly know the specifics. So I'll let you guys um, talk about that. Cool. Final question. Um, what does your morning routine look like? So my morning routine looks like waking up, not as early as I should, especially given I live on a farm. How many and I, uh 50. Holy crap. Yeah. It's huge. So. Yeah, so I've got I've got cows here and I've got chickens and my first thing I do is um, let the chickens out of the coop because they free range um, in the back area here nice. and feed them and water them and make sure the cows have their, their water troughs are all fine um, and then I get to look after myself. So I've got a pretty simple morning routine. It used to be a sure. bit more complex with lots of yoga and things but I'm, I'm in one of those down phases where just getting up and making sure the animals are taken care of and then I'm you know, at my desk at, you know, nine o'clock is enough yeah. for me at the moment. It's interesting that you said that. I've, I've probably the last three or four months been exactly the same. My partner and I moved away from, we didn't move away. We, we moved from Kangaroo Point to Mango Hill and we bought this property out here. And it's been an incredible adjustment going from uh, apartment living to a house living. And um, I've just been focusing a lot, on, a lot on that myself, actually, as well. I, I had this regimented routine in the mornings and I've just had to park a few things and just 
focus on my health and fitness at, at the gym and the business that I work in and, and these businesses that I'm doing as well and getting a lot of satisfaction out of that. But certainly I've had to park quite a few things. So, yeah, I, 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 I get what you're saying. I, I feel that. Yeah, Natalie, you've been incredible today. Um, I know we've run a little bit over time. I do apologise. Sometimes that does happen when conversations are amazing like these. Oh, good. H- however, I would um, I would like to ask, we obviously would love to connect in our community with you post-show. And one way for us to do that is to obviously get all of your details and put them in the show notes that they can um, they can connect in with you directly and obviously, obviously through different channels. How do people in the Thailand Connect community reach out to you and, and have a chat? The best way is through my website, initiationco.com. That is where to find me. I'm still fairly new and I haven't even set up all my own digital marketing channels yet. I've been building my website and sitting on Facebook doing my own lead gen <laughs> yeah, cool. similar methods that I've, I've connected with you and spoken about today so yeah absolutely check out my website initiationco.com and you'll see the services that I offer and if you want to get in touch directly you can email me um, initiationcodigital at gmail.com beautiful awesome well Natalie I will definitely put that in the show notes thank you so much and um, I really appreciate you sharing everything that you have today and uh uh, until next time, as we say it on the show, stay connected and we'll um, no doubt chat soon. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Tiling Connect. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast. To see more of Tiling Connect, jump on our socials and follow us via LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook. If you'd like to be part of the show, email us at tilingconnect at gmail.com. Until next time, stay connected.